was actually sitting on the. That's okay. We're just recording you. Keep talking. All right. Let me just punch that. It did interrupt. Well, as many of you may know um, uh, or not, uh, when I was elected to the assembly in a special election on February 28th of 2006, when I was only 22 years old, no, not true. Um, I was sitting on the Genesee Region uh, uh, Independent Living uh, Board of Directors uh, in our office at that time was over on Cedar Street um, down, uh, down, actually it was on Swan Street just before you got to Ellicott uh, Street in the city of Batavia. Uh, I think Ron Beely owned that building at that point. Uh, so I do have uh, a good background uh, in uh, in the issues that uh, are involving those with disabilities, uh, no matter what kind of disability they are, and no matter what age they are. And uh, we pretty much, uh, our board and our employees back in the day, uh, if somebody had an issue, uh, we, we tried to help them no matter what. And that's kind of the way I've tried to run my assembly office. Uh, my private business uh, has a, a motto that I came up with many years ago of neighbor helping neighbor. Uh, and I've tried to parlay that type of business philosophy uh, over into uh, representation uh, of folks. So the neighbor helping neighbor is something that I've tried to live by personally, professionally, uh, and legislatively. So um, looking forward to some of your questions today. And uh, I thank you for, for joining the group. It looks like you've got one, two, three, four, five, six. There's somebody hiding, seven. So uh, ask there away. Are, there are a couple of other people outside camera view. So. Okay, I'll get outside. Is that what you want? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, questions for the assemblyman? Can you see me? Just sit right in that seat right there. You should be able to see it. There we go. Hi, uh, my name is Maura Kelly. I'm a behavioral health liaison. And the Batavia area, Genesee County, is very concerned about the homeless situation and people trying to get shelter. Uh, there's a lot of barriers in the way of uh, trying to just get safe shelter. Is there any thing that our state government can do to help that? in this area? Yeah, and, and of course I get around the uh, assembly district, which just for your edification includes all of Genesee County, uh, all of Orleans County, uh, currently the town of Newstead in Erie County, Hamlin in Monroe County, Hamlin, Clarkson, and Sweden. The uh, starting 1-1 of 25, that assembly district changes just a little bit Still, all of Genesee and all of Orleans, the town of Newstead will be no longer part of our district, but the other three towns in Monroe stay intact, and they add, we add, if you will, the town of Wheatland, which includes uh, uh, Mumford and the village of Scottsville. So uh, I do get around uh, to those communities and many others. Uh, I'll be in Rochester tonight for an event uh, and notice visually and hear of stories of folks that are uh, that are homeless. Uh, so uh, I know that <laughs> locally, uh, I'm a Rotarian, and I know Rotary is uh, has some programs available for those that uh, are seeking shelter, if you will, or even not seeking shelter. Um, I'm sitting in my private business office now in the conference room, and I'm actually looking outside at a gentleman that I uh, see quite often downtown. Uh, and uh, I know that he's homeless. Um, folks do try to help him, uh, but uh, he's not of the he's not very attuned to that and kind of refuses any help. Uh, the state has uh, expanded our uh, mental health um, uh, types of programs and services. Um, and oftentimes homeless people do have uh, some issues that they're working with. And uh, so I don't have the specifics in front of me, but they're there have been over the last number of budget years and session years uh, programs that will try to help those in need, uh, especially as we approach winter time here. Um, I also have a question 
uh, along similar lines. Um, all of that sounds really great, and I'm super glad to hear that those are happening. But what are we doing warming shelter wise? What are we doing for the people who are able to access these services for whatever reason um, and really need access to warming shelters in Genesee County? Yeah, time and time again, it's getting shut down. Is there anything that on a state level that the assemblymen and congressmen that cover this area would be? willing to kind of help us out with to make that a possibility because it's a very big need out here. Well, uh, what I will tell you is uh, after we're done with this conversation, uh, I will uh, uh, contact the uh, county managers um, and the county executive's office of Monroe County, the county manager in Genesee, Matt Landers, and the uh, county manager, uh, Jack Welch, over in Orleans County, um, and talk to them about some of these very issues that you're bringing up. Uh, accessibility, uh, availability uh, for, for uh, those that uh, are in need. I'll talk to Social Services Department as well uh, and our Community uh, Mental Health Services Director. Uh, I will promise you that, and, and hopefully that will generate some interest in uh, helping those as we definitely approach the, uh, the winter time. Appreciate that. Just a quick question from me, Assemblyman. You are aware of the controversy surrounding consumer-directed personal assistance? I'm sorry, try me one more time. Sorry. You are aware of the controversy relating to consumer-directed personal assistance services? Are you referencing the salaries or the no. lack thereof? Uh, no, I'm referencing the single bid contract to the out-of-state provider. I am not. Aha. Uh, a moment of education for you, then I'm going to ask your opinion. Um, consumer directed personal assistance runs by fiscal intermediaries acting as employer of record for PCAs that work in the home. Uh, currently, the, the governor and the Department of Health, despite having promised independent living centers in the last budget cycle that we would be continue to allow to operate. They're moving forward with a single bid contract from an out-of-state company to take over all of the fiscal intermediary work for the entire state. I'm wondering what kind of opinion you have on something like that. It doesn't seem uh, competitive uh, at all. Uh, and uh, who's... Who has selected the uh, single uh, uh, bid? Uh, uh, that would be that would be of interest. Yeah, no. Uh, Doh was the the people that selected the bid. Selected selected the bidder, or selected the individual, or the entity, if you will, the business right. the that would receive. Okay. Correct. The out of state yeah. entity that would basically send all of the other fiscal intermediaries out of business. Now, well, I, 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 I think you probably know where I would stand on that. Uh, I'm in a private enterprise and uh, uh, bidding a bidding competitive bidding is an important process as long as the quality is uh, is the same. And, and quite frankly, we ought to be uh, I'm not sure why, uh, unless uh, the reason would be in terms of definition that it ought to be open to anyone in this country. Uh, any entity, uh, but I would certainly favor uh, uh, favor in-state businesses. Uh, we ought to be doing that uh, for those that are here as well as uh, trying to attract others to do business in the state of New York. Uh, I remember when I first ran for the assembly years ago, the some of the folks in Albany said, by the way, we'll do all your printing and all your uh, uh, messaging from here. And I said, well, what I would prefer to have is uh, uh, give me some bids uh, from the folks that you have in the Albany area, and I'll compare them to the bids that I have here in the Western New York area, many of whom are my clients, and uh, and then I'll take a look at them, and I'll make the decision of where I'll go, 
And even if some of the local businesses are a little more than the Albany business, because they do quantity discounts, obviously, uh, I'm going to go with local people uh, who pay their taxes here and provide uh, jobs for our our neighbors. Uh, so it ended up that I not only back then, but currently all the way through these 15, 16 years, uh, I always use local people uh, for all those reasons I just mentioned. So I'm I'm shocked at this. Uh, I will uh, again, I'll have a uh, uh, an email out to the commissioner of health, a new commissioner, by the way, DOH Commissioner McDonald. Uh, his brother, John McDonald, is an assemblyman uh, with me. Uh, he's a, a pharmacist. And uh, the doctor, uh, Dr. McDonald, is, a, I think, a pediatrician. Uh, and he just came on board maybe within the last year. And we've had several Zoom conferences on a variety of issues. So I'll talk to him and I'll uh, message the governor as well. She used to be my uh, congresswoman back in the day. And we do have a, uh, we do have a, a good relationship personally. Uh, sometimes we differ on uh, policy, uh, but that's okay. That's what it's all about. I do that with respect. Thank you so much. Any other questions for the assemblyman? I'm sorry to make you late for your 1125, but I really appreciate you uh, sticking with us and uh, getting things kicked off here. Thank you so much for your time, assemblyman. And right back at you. Uh, God bless all of you and uh, keep the faith. Please go. There we go. So I'm writing down the uh, issues, the barriers which one was. Now, while the schedule does identify uh, Diane Sear is uh, I don't see her being next. We don't see her yet. So we're just waiting for the next candidate to arrive, Sarah. which by the schedule should be Mr. Wagenhauser. Is that, that correct? Come on in. Where do I go? Up front here? Yep. Right up here by the table. How's this? Good. Wonderful. Make yourself comfortable. That's me standing. Now, you are uh, Democratic for Congress against whom? Claudia Tenney. Thank you. Let me tell you a little bit about myself in case you don't know, but I'm sure you've all gone on my website and my social media and all that. I grew up not that far from here, Brockport, Spenceport, and I had a single mom who was a nurse. And we didn't have much. I was out picking fruit um, at 13, 14 years old in the farms around us to help us uh, make ends meet. Um, but my mother always said that, you know, we had responsibility to help others. And that's kind of what I always have done since then. I went to school first at SUNY Brockport, then I went to law school at Syracuse, and I went to Washington, D.C., where I was a public interest attorney. And I fought for consumers, and I fought for people who were being gouged by um, big corporations. And I've testified before House and Senate, both Houses of Congress. I worked on bipartisan legislation. Um, but what's probably most interesting to you is that I left. Um, I was called home to Brockport, where my mother was starting a home care agency. So for 15 years, I was helping people, seniors and disabled, remain independent in their homes. I know what you're going through. I know how many hurdles you got to jump through. Because I've seen it. Um, we served Genesee County, we served Western Monroe County, and we served Orleans County. And um, while I did most of the management stuff, um, I saw what happened. And I did meet a lot of uh, the people we were helping. Um, so if you're curious now what my commitment will be, you have to first understand that I am running for federal office. And a lot of the, a lot of the things happen at the state level. Um, but things I see um, are first Medicaid. You have to ensure that the money comes from Washington to New York to get to the people who need it. And that's where the Medicaid comes in. There are people who want to cut it, people who want to substantially cut it. Those are not people um, that I think have the right idea of what needs to be done for people from New York. I think we need to address frankly, more state, but also perhaps federal, the issue of unemployment, 
for the sake of it. It's two, three times um, what it is for others who are not disabled. And whether we offer tax incentives to businesses or whether we support groups such as ARP who's doing training, these are places where we can uh, start to make a difference because so many people, I you know if you're sitting home now, you'd rather have the remote control in your hand, your life, your freedom, control and independence. You get up when you want, you watch what you want, and you live the life that you, um, and the freedom that everyone else has, because you're no different. So that's where I am. Um, I've been running in this district, uh, which is a district encompassing 14 counties from Lewiston up in north of Niagara Falls to Watertown, down to Schuyler and Steuben County. And I've driven 18,000 miles driving around and talking to people, finding out what's important. And it was important for me to come here today. I didn't want to do the Zoom because um, I have the ability to come here. I wanted to come here, see you, listen to you, hopefully answer your questions. Um, so I welcome your questions. Uh, assuming you win, you're, you'll be a freshman congressman. Um, recognizing your prior experience in providing aid service, can you tell me a bill you would propose that you think would improve the lives of people with disabilities? Well, first I would say, I say the Medicaid thing is, is probably the most important thing because so much funding goes to the Medicaid. Now, I did talk about a couple of things. I don't know the extent of either. Um, <coughs> money for job training or many are the ability to incentivize small businesses to hire disabled people um, so that I haven't, had, to be honest, I haven't worked on the entire bill in my mind at this point, but the ability to incentivize um, small businesses because that's what they want. They want incentives to do things because they're in the business of making money. Like, that's not a bad thing. Um, so I guess I guess I would go in that way um, because I think having a job, having income, having the ability to spend the money how you want, uh, I think that's important and um, helps free up and um, increase our independence. Thank you. Question. Yeah, so I have a uh, kind of two part question. Uh, would you support additional federal transportation money um, to expand into paratransit services? Um, and also not just including that with people who are disabled, but also with transportation services for people who are struggling with substance abuse and other addiction needs, um, specifically so they could get to long-term appointments so they could work on recovering and not being under the influence anymore so they could have access to these services that are really great in theory, but you have to be so sober in, in order to get that. And for a lot of people, they have to be able to get there. Correct. Um, you've got about four questions there. <laughs> yes, sorry. Um, well, you know, I, I can remember when we were doing home care, transportation was a big issue. Um, our, what we were doing at that point was providing ADL to activities of daily living, something with you know, bathing, dressing, that type of thing, housekeeping, meal preparation. But the problem with um, transportation to doctor's offices, our appointments, um, or any type of other type of appointments um, was what the state would allow us to do and what, what our um, workers comp would allow us to do so that we couldn't always have uh, our employees driving people where they needed to do, where needed to be, which was a problem. There was some transportation available here. There, I know there was in Orleans County. I'm not sure about Genesee County. I remember it was very difficult to get at times and um, difficult to get at times. Um, I'm not sure if there was a charge, but I don't think there was. I think it may have been, um, part, may have gone through Medicaid if I'm not mistaken. Do we need the availability to get? Absolutely. Do we need more mental health care out here? 100%. Rural areas now have a real dearth problem. There's no mental health coverage here. As many of you know, if you need medications, depression, anxiety, which so many people have, death of a loved one, 50% of all of us will have those problems. You need to get medication 
you want to go to a psychiatrist. If you're a general practitioner, not quite as uh, up on all of the new SSRIs, that type of thing. To get an appointment with a psychiatrist now, you can wait three months. If you're lucky, you'll get one. If not longer. If not longer, absolutely. These are three months that a lot of people don't make it through because we also have a high degree of suicide in rural areas. And it's not just kids who are struggling with other issues. It's also elderly people, seniors, including a lot of vets. So getting the people, the help they need on mental health, including addiction, is one thing that I've talked about a lot. And if you go to my website, you see it on one of my priorities. Some of the problems there are insurance companies who do not think that mental health issues rise to the level of physical. And I think most of us, I certainly hope most of us don't believe that's the case, but it's a way to save money for them. What can be done is we need to first get more people out there. That would be psychiatrists, that would be therapists. So I know people who've tried the um, therapy via Zoom, and what I've heard is it just doesn't work. Um, being with someone, listening to them is a big deal for these people. So what we need to do is train people. That means school assistants. That means providing incentives for people and doctors. Now we do have, and we do currently um, help doctors who are just coming out of school to be able to go to uh, more rural areas. And we have the ability to help them with their school loans, which are usually enormous. I would encourage this to be done. It is being done to some extent now um, with mental health, but we need it to be done more. Um, and insurance companies must treat insure, or the um, providers as they would treat other providers. If you've met any therapists, MSWs, or the like out in this area or any other area, what they'll tell you is they're fighting with insurance to get paid, whether it's six months later or get paid at all. It's a battle. Um, you see people shaking their heads. They've, they've seen this problem. So we need to do a number of things to make a parity. And if any of you have experienced this and you have insurance, you could have a blues and only one person out of 20 in the area has the exact type that that insurance company will accept. So much that needs, needs to be done now to make it available and so that we can help these people who are having addiction problems as well as um, those having uh, other mental health issues. Did I answer that question? Yes. Well, it took me like 15, <laughs> five minutes. Oh, you have four questions. Though. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else have any questions? I actually do. So I am a transition specialist assisting people getting out of the nursing homes back in the community. A barrier that is starting to come about now is um, with Medicaid, they are changing what they will allow the MLTCs to go, which is in turn having some M MLTCs shut down. And that provides services for those who are transitioning back into community for nurse long-term care. What would you do to advocate to try to stop that? <laughs> I guess they will say. Okay, so the state, because they administer this, is making it more difficult. Um, is, it, what is, is it still called a nursing home transition something like that? Right. Yeah. Um, so they still have it. It's been a while since I've been um, I remember it was very helpful. You could get grants made, um, you could make uh, facilities such as the bathroom and other places accessible. Which, which makes sense. We, we save money in the long run. I know a lot of people will look at these type of programs and say, oh my God, we can't spend the money. We're running a deficit, we have no money. When instead, we're saving money by keeping people out of institutions, which you know, you're talking 10 to $15,000 a year for just even middle level care. Um, $124,000 per person per year in the region that you're in. Okay. Um, not much has changed. Um, so we need to keep people in the home. That's where most people want to be. You rarely find people that say, hey, can I go to the uh, nursing home now? Or uh, now some of the assisted living facility, the assisted care, or assisted care facilities, but some of those are pretty nice. Um, but still, I see people just say, no, I want to be at my chair 
um, my house, my remote, if not when I want. And that's what we have to continue to, to put forward. Now, if there's um, problems with the state cutting back, I'm not surprised. Um, I'm not gonna say too much about the state budget. It's not really a federal, is federal issue. But anyway, we can ensure that there's more Medicaid money coming to the state. I don't think you can earmark it specifically for a program. Um, but, so as far as encouraging them to do it, it's not really a federal issue. Um, we'll have state people here get them on that later on. Yeah, because it is important. I mean, this is a lot of what you people are doing here, what independent living is about. And it's a place where I spent 15 years, learned a lot, and would welcome you as a resource and would welcome you to contact me. I'm not gonna be someone who's gonna um, not listen or not come back here. Um, in fact, what I wanna do is have a two hour a week um, live call in where you, I can, will listen to questions, concerns, complaints, that type of thing, so that we can keep in touch when I can't come back home. Um, I wasn't, you know, what people say, well, they're just gonna go to Washington DC to, uh, to get the power and the money and all that. I had that. I was in Washington, D.C. I was a public interest attorney and I was executive director of a public interest group. I did the CNN. I did all that kind of stuff. Okay? And I came home. I came home because that's important. And that's what's needed. Um, so I will listen to you. I look forward to hearing from you. Um, and I hope you'll feel free to always um, tell me what's important to you and how your life can be better. Any other questions? Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> now we are going to pause recording at this time while we wait for Mr. Graff to arrive on the schedule and perhaps uh, we'll see uh, 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 Diane or Diane's representative. Uh, if we don't, please, you are encouraged to go back to the window YouTube channel and look at the Buffalo Meet the Candidates Day because uh, they also did an appearance there. So you could have an example of what you would say here by looking at that video. Go ahead. Yes, I have. Sorry, are you Mr. Graff? Oh, yeah. Okay, hi. Welcome. I'm Maura Kelly. Hello, Maura. The West New York Infidelity. Hi. So, so, have you been here? Have you been I, I haven't, no. Okay, so this is the Independent Living in Johnson County. Okay. Uh, people well, I shouldn't say I, I haven't been right. here in the building, but I haven't been this morning. So, people <laughs> just ask questions. Uh, some related to uh, disability issues, and uh, so uh, you're running for senator. No, I'm doing for sure. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. right. oh, <laughs> <laughs> you out of center. Uh, nope, so, uh, I'm running for sure. So okay, all right. I can explain that. To, uh, okay. A about that, so. so this is Joseph Braff sure. running for sure. Welcome. So thank you. All right, are we ready to go? Yeah. Well, 15 already. Yeah. Okay. I guess we're a little this early. Time. Have we unpaused yes. on the recording? Excellent. Hi, John. Good morning. Good morning. I'm just here to moderate the conversation. So okay. you can begin whenever you're ready. All right, sure. Well, uh, thank you for having me, everybody. I'll, I'll just uh, tell you who I am a little bit about myself and we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, so my name is Joe Graff. Uh, I'm running for uh, Genesee County Sheriff this year in Genesee County. Uh, most of you probably might not know much about me or probably don't know anything about me. So I'll just give you a little bit of a background about that because. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have and, and we'll go from there. Uh, so I've been around law enforcement here in Genesee County for more than 25 years. I started my career at the Genesee County Probation Department as a probation officer. Um, I worked there for about five years, gained a lot of experience uh, dealing with you know, all types of individuals throughout our community. Saw a lot of success stories of people who were successful at uh, you know, performing their lives and also was able to hold people accountable when they maybe didn't make the, the right choices. Um, after probation department, I got hired at the uh, Genesee County Sheriff's Office in 2004. 
Um, as a deputy sheriff, I spent uh, the initial part of my career on road patrol uh, for about the first 10, 11 years. I worked the afternoon shift, um, which is generally the, one of the more busier productive shifts at the sheriff's office. We see uh, you know, a variety of pretty much any crime that, uh, that you can think of, uh, you know, as well as you know, offering assistance to people just in, in, in general matters too. Um, in 2017, late 2017, I was promoted to Chief Deputy of the Road Patrol Division. Um, in that position, um, I was uh, coordinated the efforts of the, uh, the Patrol Division, which are the, the you know, Mark Police Guards, the Deputy Sheriffs, which you see driving around, uh, you know, work at scheduling, budgeting, uh, you know, handling the, uh, the daily activities of the Road Patrol, also coordinated with the SROs in our schools. Um, in 2019, I was promoted to uh, Chief Deputy of the Criminal Investigation Division, which is my current role where I, I presently serve. Um, so uh, in my role as the Chief of, of the Investigation Division, I uh, oversee a staff of investigators who handle the more serious crimes that we see here in the county. Um, so uh, the types of crimes that we would deal with would be uh, incidences that maybe the Bull Patrol um, doesn't have uh, the dedicated time to dedicate to a long-term investigation. Um, so we would handle those. Um, also, I oversee the drug task force, which operates uh, in the county to, to work to eradicate the community of uh, drug trafficking and, and drugs that, that come into our county. Uh, so as I mentioned, I've been in law enforcement for over 25 years, 20 of which at the sheriff's office, specifically as a deputy sheriff. You know, I've worked in our community um, during that time, you know, promoting you know, a safe community for everyone to live in. My professional investment in the community, I think, speaks to my career here in Genesee County. Um, and, you know, I have a personal investment in this community, too. I live here. Uh, my family lives here. I have you know, three daughters that live here. My wife lives here. Um, so I, you know, certainly have a, a vested interest in, in watching our community grow and, and prosper. Uh, you know, I believe that, you know, having, we do live in a city community. I, I do believe that. And that comes from a lot of different factors. You know, the work of law enforcement um, certainly plays into that, but I think just uh, our community in a whole, when we look at uh, the education system we have, the family support networks that we have, the community uh, engagement that we have, um, the different uh, types of outreach that we do in the county, our mental health treatment facilities, our substance abuse treatment, all those things feed into uh, building the same community. Um, as sheriff, it would be one of my goals to continue to, uh, you know, our commitment to, to providing a safe community for everybody. Uh, the tradition of service that's been upheld at the sheriff's office, so I look to continue that, as well as, you know, law enforcement has been changing throughout the years. Uh, even in my career throughout law enforcement, uh, we're you know, certainly seeing different types of crime and different things um, that we did 20 years ago. Uh, you know, I would look to keep our office uh, in step with current crime trends and making sure that we're, uh, we're able to meet the needs of the community moving forward. Okay. <clears throat> Questions from the audience? So, so my name is Warren Kelly. I the what West New York uh, Behavioral Health and Behavioral Health Liaison. I sit on a committee that was taken, it was from Monroe County, the Erie County Threat Advisory yes. Task Force. I think you presented there. Uh, but uh, in the 90s, there was thousands of people with psychiatric diagnoses in institutions. And we are in the community. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting on these task force, this task force, amazed of the the not the uninformed uh, knowledge that law enforcement has. And I I thank you so much for all the service you do and your your offices do. But and I I know you guys aren't mental health providers, but our community has changed and our community is interwoven with people historically with psychiatric diagnoses and currently psychiatric diagnoses. And I'm very concerned that the fear and the unknown that police officers present, such as someone who's psychotic going into a bar, having a drink, it, I'm concerned of the lack of knowledge is infringing on our rights, my rights to just have a, a nice life in the community. So how, how, can you, as a leader in our community, address those needs, address people with mental health disabilities living in the community and not our rights being infringed on because of lack of information? Sure, I think that's something that certainly we are progressing in the, the right direction. Um, we have uh, 
<clears throat> you mentioned the threat assessment committee. We do have a threat assessment committee, uh, which deals with more serious emerging threats, people who you know might be coming through the system who might not have a, a law enforcement contact yet, or maybe they've had a contact with some other person. And, and then those are the people with that <clears throat> with minor behavior problems are being presented. These examples have been presented at mm -hmm. our threaded as the serious mass shooting threat assessment committees. Right. These poor people are being presented. Um, I haven't seen that here in Genesee County. I'll be honest with you. And the threat assessment community that we have has dealt with serious threats throughout our community. I think if something's brought to that community uh, or that, that uh, committee, which doesn't meet the threshold of a threat to our community, then we mitigate that and, and put it in the, in the correct direction. But I think we are certainly progressing in the right direction. Uh, we, we partner with our mental health services here in Genesee County. Uh, we have deputies that are specifically trained in crisis intervention training, uh, which we are, are pushing that to, to try to get as many deputies as they can train. Uh, you know, I'll acknowledge that throughout the years, law enforcement probably hasn't been the best at that. But I think we are moving in the right direction with becoming more cognizant of you know, people with mental health needs and people who, uh, you know, interact with the community maybe in a different way. Uh, but uh, law enforcement certainly needs to recognize that it, it, you know, not everybody with, that has a mental health condition um, has a criminal justice problem. And, and that, that, that's for sure something that we realize. So, so my concern is only 3% of people with serious mental illness that are a danger. Mm -hmm. And, that, and I, I hear as part of the committees talking about serious pe people with serious concern that you have. Mm -hmm. And I'm concerned that you don't know enough about mental health disabilities mm -hmm. to realize that maybe we are a threat and maybe our rights don't need to be taken if you were more informed or more uh, understanding of what you're dealing with. And, and mental illness is such a complex thing. I think because of the complexities, fear gets in the way of our rights. Sure. And that's exactly why we have people from the mental health community on our threat assessment committee board. I mean, that they sit in the same room. With right. And who chairs the committee? The, the law enforcement, right? No, it's a coalition okay. between everybody. So when you say who's in charge of it, uh, right. we, I think we coordinate it, um, but um, certainly it's a community-wide effort. And our mental health professionals in Genesee County play a giant role in that. Um, right. In that. In that community. That we have. Law, law enforcement <laughs> more broadly <laughs> has a need for increased training and understanding of people with disabilities in general. Mm -hmm. um, uh, mental health is a very large component of that understanding, but also autism, people with developmental disabilities, you know, anybody who's going to exhibit a behavior that an officer is going to need to observe, right? What, um, how willing are you as sheriff to give your deputies additional training to, to make sure they have knowledge when they're on the street? Certainly, I, I mean, my willingness to do that, I, I'm, I'm willing to do all of that. Um, certainly, um, all of our deputies are trained, uh, you know, when they go to the police academy, are trained on recognizing, and you know, there's a, they, they have such a broad spectrum of things that they need to deal with. Um, in a long the period. standard central police services component. Yes, yes. There's so much that they need to, to uh, take in, but certainly they do receive initial training. Um, I'm open to any training that, that we can offer our deputies to better themselves in, in any uh, facet of their, uh, their work. Not to um, cut you off, um, no. but this also is tying very much into my question. I think this is a good mm -hmm. point to sure. pop in because um, I also kind of have some advice and ideas that I think maybe you could, like avenues you could proceed. Um, I think one of the big things as, um, so to give you a little bit of my background, I was a foster care youth. Okay. Um, it, I was told my entire life that I was going to be a statistic that was going to be nothing but end up in jail. I was going to be a criminal. Literally just because I was a foster care youth. The main people telling me that was the sheriff's department. I was going to residential treatment centers that were located directly next to a sheriff's office. So even if I wasn't talking to sheriff directly, mm -hmm. just knowing that the place that I was living 24 seven being that closely tied to police, just in case left, I'm sorry to say this, but left a bad taste in my mouth. That was 
so hard to deal with as a youth that was dealing with so many other things. Um, I don't think the trainings need to be limited to just disabilities for those reasons or mental health, any high risk population. And those trainings not being when the police force comes in for those initial trainings being like, these are the signs you should recognize for a mental health emergency and a crisis. It being, hey, these are things that you can see in the field where you take a step back, where you call somebody else. You don't use a stern voice with this person. I feel like police a lot of times are told constantly what they should and shouldn't do. But when they are told that shouldn't do, they aren't given another avenue of what to do in place of that. We shouldn't have that panic mode of what to do in that moment when they're in that crisis moment. They should already have that backup plan. So instead of them calling EMTs because they think this person is in a crisis, when in reality, it's what we see somebody walking through our doors every single day. Western New York independent living should be on that phone call list or DSS or other mitigation agencies instead of them just instantly going into the hospital because now they're having to deal with CPAP. Now they're having to deal with secondary visits from sheriffs to get their guns taken away, which when the police come for that first visit, they don't get told about that. So now they go into the hospital and then they come out and now they're having to see the sheriff's department again. Nobody told them they were gonna have that other meeting which can now lead to another crisis and cause this cycle all over again. So I feel like if we just have that training that we're giving our clients to, to learn how to work better with the police, I feel like if the police force and sheriff's department were also given that same training, different LGBT cultural competency training, general harm reduction and high risk population trainings and really understanding what that means to work with those populations, could really help mitigate some of these different issues. And like, I'm so glad you're willing to do this, but we have people dying every single moment that we are hesitating. So these boards and these task force that are taking months to decide whether or not these trainings are important, now potentially 15 people passed away in that time that that decision was made. They could have been helped by that training. So it really like, this is something that as soon as humanly possible could be instated, should be. I, I appreciate your comments. I'm sorry that that happened to you. Uh, you know, your negative contacts with, with police and, and, you know, if it was our sheriff's office, I'm, I'm not sure specifically, but, um, you know, as, as I mentioned early, early on, you know, the, the face of law enforcement certainly changed in the, in the course of my career. Um, and I, I it's going to continue to change in the, in the future. Which um, so appreciate. Yeah, we're dealing with you know different populations, different people's needs, um, and, and certainly you know our training efforts at the sheriff's office try to stay in tune with what our community is looking for, what our community needs are. Um, so you know any training that's offered, any training that's available that can make our deputies able to better respond to situations, and of course I, I'm, I'm willing to to you know push that and uh, you know be part of that team. Um, can you work with the commissioner? Because it's not a sheriff law enforcement problem. It's a mental health community sure. support problem Correct. that police are brought into because there's no one else. Can yeah. I, Do you have a relationship with the commissioners, with uh, mental health leaders, with OMH to fill the gap? You know, I had the police come to my door and it was my home. It's very upsetting. My dog was barking too much, mm -hmm. but it still created some, sure. you know, yeah. but, but like, if can, can you, like, will you work with other, the community and the state office of mental health to meet the needs so you're not at the front door? Yeah, well, we already are doing that. I can say, I can tell you that. Um, so we have a, a great relationship with Genesee County Mental Health, um, and the director over there. Um, but we've already implemented, uh, as I said, crisis intervention training, which deals with that. So we have officers that are specifically trained um, to handle those types of situations. Uh, we do have, as you mentioned, someone else to call now, uh, where maybe 20 years ago we didn't have that. Now we do have people to call. Uh, can I ask who that is to call? Because when I specifically have called sure. as a mandated reporter, I've had to paint slip somebody. 
I let them know that it was not emergent. I let them know the person was not at risk of endangering anybody but themselves. And it was not a police related issue. I just needed the mobile mental health crisis team. Yeah. Um, I proceeded to have an Orleans County Sheriff show up, an Orleans County EMT, and then I had two Genesee County police uh, like cars show up. And one of them was a K-9 unit. Yeah. I don't think because somebody had a panic attack. Well, it depends that... on, I mean, not to, I guess it depends on the specific circumstances, not knowing all the circumstances of that specific incident. I would be irresponsible for me to answer, you know, why that would have happened or why that could have happened. Uh, but the mobile response team is exactly who I was referring to. And so we do have some other people to call. Um, when, you know, if our deputies show up on a scene and maybe it's a, a situation that, that isn't warranting an immediate law enforcement response, um, you know, we have been you know, kind of changing the mindset that now we have time to deal with this. Um, there doesn't need to be an immediate resolution. Uh, we can sit back and, and figure out exactly what the best choice is for this person um, and call mental health, call the crisis intervention team. As a lot of times for that person to even just see an <clears throat> officer dressed in officer <clears throat> uniform, that is a trigger. Sure. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. mental health is going to have more of that background than the sheriff's department sure. will typically. Yeah. Developmental disabilities as well. Correct. Correct. You've got some autistic mm -hmm. folks because of negative interaction with law enforcement. Mm -hmm create a perseveration around the image of law enforcement. So like they concept. won't even go into a psych unit yep. because they know sheriffs, or not sheriffs, security patrol yep. the unit. And seeing that uniform would be such a detriment, they would rather take care of that at home. Now, I just want to make sure, does anybody else have any yes, questions? I, I, the sheriff I, have a, I have a question. Sure. Um, a while ago, uh, encountered a situation where 911 had been called for a person that was, was having, uh, there was a lot of things happening. Um, the law enforcement came and um, it was not about, you know, no, this person does not need to be arrested. They need to have assistance to emergency room care. Mm -hmm. And the uh, conversation that kind of came about after that with the, with the officer that was present was, his frustration of we understand, you know, that people need care and we try, we try to get that for them. We take them in for evaluation and before our officer can get back to our county, that person is then discharged from emergency room care. Now, if I'm going in for a heart attack, you know, if I'm, I'm, if I'm having a medical issue, I'm not like just, you know, a half hour later put out on the street. And um, is there some advocacy from law enforcement agencies around that particular mental health issue and crisis that we have in our emergency rooms and our hospitals, places where sometimes people have to go for help? I mean, I can tell you that that issue has been, you know, certainly something that law enforcement has, has you know, certainly through my career has been, you know, an issue. Um, you know, I, I think the, the um, Healthcare system in whole is probably strained, and that's probably part of the you know, real problem with that. Um, you know, there are certain instances where uh, a deputy is, is going to have to require someone to go to the hospital um, if they present as an immediate threat to themselves or a threat to somebody else. They're required to send that person in. Um, and the deputies aren't uh, psychiatrists; they're not. Uh, you know, they're they're, they're not, I, I guess, qualified to to make that decision. Um, that the person ultimately isn't a threat. So when the person goes to the hospital and they're seen by a mental health professional or a psychiatrist who deems them not to be a threat and they release them, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, the sheriff's office you know, doesn't really play a role in the, the end decision on that. No, I, I get that. I guess I'm just you thinking, know. you know, there, there's a, a real need for a lot of advocacy around that. Uh, people uh, can get good uh, quality sure. care uh, when they go. You know, not just a, a what they experience in the sure. emergency room setting, which what, what Todd brought up about individuals with developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. I've been in an emergency room setting sure. where I've seen someone come in mm -hmm. on sensory overload with everything that's going on around them, and they end up restraining the person because they don't know how to deal with sure. them. You know, and I, I think you know, the more community partners, mm -hmm. you know, 
independent living, law enforcement, mm -hmm. you know, DSS, mm -hmm. the more community partners that can come together, that, that we are the people who are seeing this happen in our broken system. And the more people that can come together to work together to address that, the better. If there is ever an opportunity for one of our independent living organizations to be a part of some of that advocacy, some of those kinds of things, the law enforcement would be willing to entertain or get involved in. That is absolutely something that we feel pretty strongly about. Yeah, we would certainly support any of those initiatives. Uh, you know, the law enforcement response to a problem. Uh, you have that sometimes. Home. Did anyone with a psychiatric disability on here do threat advisory council? Um, uh, outward, uh, an outward, not secretly, what someone that presents with a. Someone who publicly acknowledges having no health experience. And I think that's what I'm talking about when I say, you know, it's like we all have, we have to keep the table together, you know, for everybody to really understand. And, um, you know, so we would absolutely welcome an invitation to that. So that's the okay. point your time. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Uh, well, thank you so much for coming in and talking to us today. Sure. Well, thank you for your time, folks. I appreciate it. All right. Make sure you get out and vote. Yeah. 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 And good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Take care, folks. Yep. So, here. since he is the last <laughs> listed candidate we have today, uh, we're going to end the broadcast now for those folks uh, uh, who uh, want more information can definitely go to the window to the YouTube page for Western York Independent Living. I want to remind you that uh, on the day that we are airing this, which is Tuesday the 22nd, the deadline for registering to vote is uh, Friday the 25th. So please register to vote and please go on November the 2nd, 3rd, and cast your ballot. Very important that you cast your ballot. If you need any assistance in being able to do any of that, please contact Independent Living in the Genesee region. Thank you so much. Have a great day.